Alvin's testimony there just caps it off, I think, just to see someone trust Christ, you know, and to see that decision made is exciting. I can say that I told Morris Gleiser, I could tell that he was really constrained to preach that message that spoke to your heart, and I went up to him afterward, and I said, I could tell that that was difficult for you, and he said it was. I really felt like the Lord wanted me to, to preach that, and that was the reason. Uh, the Lord wanted to do something in Alvin's life, and I think some others as well uh, trusted the Lord. So we praise the Lord for that. Psalm 37, and we're going to look at two verses here in a moment. I grew up going to camp, um, went down to North Carolina to the wilds many times, and the Lord worked in my heart many times down there. We come back uh, to church and share, much like the teens just did, what the Lord did in my heart. And <clears throat> the thing that is often whispered and even we struggle with coming back from camp is, how's this going to last? How's this going to, is my life truly going to be changed? Is God really after doing something permanent in my life? And it's a real struggle that we face, and it, it's not just a struggle with when you go away to Wisconsin or North Carolina or anywhere else a Christian camp is. It's a struggle that we face in Cedar Rapids. Um, maybe the Lord dealt with you about something several weeks ago, and you, you're sitting here, and you're like, oh, yeah, the, I remember that. You know, the Lord taught me that, and what have I been doing? And, and you, you feel like things are, are lost somewhat, and this verse uh, has encouraged me greatly. And before, first of all, I want to tell you that the decisions that you make any time in your Christian life, God takes great interest in. Uh, I can tell you one decision I made at camp that the Lord never let me come back from, and that is uh, I decided in 1996 that I was going to surrender my life to serve the Lord full time in the ministry. And by God's grace, here I am. The Lord has brought me to that point. And it's because of the verse we're about to read. Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he, that is God, delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. I want us to see two things about godly decisions very briefly this afternoon. The first of all, first thing I want us to see is the nature of the decisions of a good man. The decisions of a good man. It says good man there. You'll see that it's in italics. Um, a man that is good in scripture is not someone who is just on their best behavior. A good man we know this, is a man with God's righteousness. Righteousness is basically meeting God's expectations. And none of us can meet God's expectations. And so therefore, none of us are righteous by ourselves, but God has taken it upon himself. He saw that we would not make it, that we would not meet his expectations. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and was buried and rose again and met God's every expectations, not for his own sake, but for my sake, for my, on my behalf. And he's willing, as Alvin said, to give me that slate, to give me that righteousness, and he takes my slate, he takes my wickedness. And I can now, in God's eyes, be called a good man. Not because I'm a good man, I'm not a good man, but because Jesus Christ is a good man on my behalf. Righteousness has been imputed to my account. Romans 4 talks about. It also says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, He who has believed on Jesus and called on His name has been saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, we're told, shall be saved. So for those of us who have called on the name of the Lord, and I trust that's everyone here, God looks at us and He says, that's a good man, that's a good lady. Not because we're good, but because he's good. And these truths can be true. These statements can be true of us in verse 23. The steps of a good man, a good woman, a righteous man, a righteous woman are ordered by the Lord. 
What are the steps that he's talking about? Steps are a series of decisions and circumstances in which we find ourselves. We make decisions all the time, whether we're going to, uh, whether we're going to you know, have chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream, which is not a really hard decision at all, but, um, you know, it's always chocolate. But um, whether we're going to have, you know, whether we're going to go to college or not, where we're going to go to college, whether we're going to get married or not, who we're going to marry, and these types of things. And those decisions, some of those are massive decisions, and they're very important decisions. They're steps. You know the name George Mueller. He was the preacher uh, a couple centuries ago that began orphanages for homeless children in the streets of London. And he trusted God to provide for those homeless children in his orphanage. He didn't have, he wasn't a man of <clears throat> great wealth. He had nothing. And he prayed constantly. If you can read his autobiography, he, he would pray constantly that God would provide. And God, it's a fascinating story, uh, how God provided for those children and answered prayer from George Mueller. George Mueller wrote in his Bible next to Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. George Mueller penciled into the margin, the steps and stops. The steps and the stops of a good man are ordered by the Lord, meaning a good man is walking and sometimes God says, stop, don't take another step. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what to do. And we have to wait on the Lord. We don't know the step that we're to take. And it's frustrating sometimes, but Mueller needed to know that. He needed to remember that the steps and the stops of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We, also, we often must simply stop and just wait on the Lord to make the way clear. But those decisions that we make, those steps that we take or don't take, it says, are ordered by the Lord. They're ordered. It means they are established by the Lord. Matthew Henry writes, by God's providence, he overrules the events that concern, that concern the uh, righteous men and women so as to make their way plain before them, both what they should do and what they expect, what they may expect. Observe, God orders the steps of a good man. Not only his way in general, but his written word, but his, by his written word, but his particular steps by the whispers of conscience. This is the way. Walk in it. He does not always show him his way at a distance, but leads him step by step as children are led, and so keeps him in a continual dependence upon his guidance. So there's the sense that God directs every step. There's also a sense in this word that God makes his decisions firm and lasting, and he assists him in those decisions. I was trying to think of an illustration of this. I grew up riding a bicycle, as probably all of you did, and I would go from place to place. In North Carolina, we, had a, we lived on a retired dairy farm. There was acres and acres of places to ride and stuff. But at one point, my dad decided to get my brother and I a go-kart. We had several go-karts growing up. And probably extremely dangerous for little boys like us, but we enjoyed them to the nth degree. We had a go-kart and uh, Briggs and Stratton engine on the back, no governor whatsoever, and uh, it was awesome. I mean, we would, we would decide, I want to go across the field, and you would hit that go-kart, and you could hear the dogging of the engine, and it would take off, the clutch would kick in, and you'd be screaming across the field in a go-kart. And uh, my decisions went from pedal, 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 I'm not sure if I want to do this, I don't, I don't know about this, to let's go there, hit the gas pedal. And I was assisted in that direction. Um, my go-kart growing up, I did not know what power steering was. Um, you know, when you wanted to turn, you just yank the wheel really, really hard, and it was hard to turn. Nowadays, they have go-karts with power steering. They have cars with power steering. Um, you, you turn your wheel. You don't appreciate power steering until it goes out, right? Um, so your serpentine belt goes out. But, uh, you know, you turn the wheel and the car just, I mean, it just turns like, I mean, you could turn it with one finger sitting in park and you have hydraulics down there on your differential that are, that are turning your, your wheels one way or the other. And your decision is being established, okay? You make a decision and your decision by your hydraulic system is being established, the steps of a good man 
are established by the Lord. You say, Lord, I want to go this way because I believe that's the way you want me to go. And God establishes your decision. He empowers your decision. God takes pleasure in the path that a good man takes. He not only establishes his decisions, it says God delights in his way. For God to delight in anything. Sometimes we think of God as very serious. And God is very serious. And I want to be very reverent here as I deal with this. God is a holy God. And we can be flippant when we approach God. But do you realize that God is infinitely joyful? He delights in what He does. In Jeremiah 9.24, it says that God delights in exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. In Zephaniah 3.17, we're told that the Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will rejoice over you with gladness. God is excited. What is He excited about? Verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and God is excited about his way. He delights in his way. What do you do when you delight in something? Your heart thrills at it. You, you love to think about it. We're told in Psalm 1, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. You, know, you have this memorized? The, the, uh, the, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. What does it mean that God knows the way of the righteous? If I came up to you and uh, you're standing um, next to your spouse, you uh, adults or teens, if you, your best friend standing there, one of your good friends, somebody, a stranger comes up to you and they say, uh, I'm looking for, and they name either your best friend or your spouse, I'm looking for so-and-so, do you know them? You would say, know them. They're my best friend. They're my spouse. I, you know, if, I, if, I come, if you come to me and, and you say, do you know Jessica Linville? I would say, know her? Yeah, I, I know her. She's my wife. <laughs> uh, I know her as, as good as, as she can be known. And, and the Lord, the sense of this word, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He is acquainted with the way of the righteous. He is interested. He delights in the way of the righteous. He takes pleasure in the path that the righteous man is taking. So I want to say this. I'll mention this in just a moment. But teens, the Lord is excited about the decisions that you have made. He is excited about the direction that you're taking. Adults, if you've made decisions, and I trust you have, uh, we, we don't stop making decisions just because we come home from camp, but if you're seeking to walk with the Lord, the Lord is delighted in the path that you're taking. He has also established the steps that you have taken. I, this fascinates me every time I think about it. I'd like you to turn to Philippians 2. I'm just going to remind you of this verse that I frequently visit. Philippians 2, verse 12. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. God establishes our steps. This is what it means. Verse 12, Philippians 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That is, demonstrate to the world the righteousness that God has placed in you, work it out. Let it be seen. See to it that you live in a godly way. Do your devotions. Spend time in prayer. Tell people about Jesus. Fight sin. Memorize scripture. Quote scripture to yourself. See to it that you live a godly life. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it? Verse 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and and to do for his good pleasure. I got news for you. If you decided to draw closer to Jesus Christ at camp, teens, over the past few weeks, adults, if you decided to draw closer to Jesus Christ, to fight sin, to draw nearer to God, guess who decided that? Guess who initiated that? Guess who is assisting you in that? Guess who is empowering you as you go screaming across the field in your go kart? Guess who's doing that? Who is? God is. God is behind 
you living out your salvation. The steps of a good man are ordered, established, assisted by the Lord. And God takes pleasure in the path he's taking. Not only the decisions of a good man, but secondly, let's see the deliverance of a good man. The last part, the next verse says, though he fall, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. How many of you have made a decision and failed at your decision? Can I see your hands? Okay, all of us. All right. The deliverance of a good man. Failure is never final for a good man. For a righteous man, with God's righteousness, failure is never final. Paul made a statement. You can look at it in 2 Corinthians 4, 9. I'll read it to you here. 2 Corinthians 4, 9. Paul is cataloging his struggles. And he says... But we have, verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. What does it mean to be perplexed? You got a synonym synonym, synonym for that? Okay, confused, puzzled. I think we could probably get frustrated when we're perplexed. Does that sound right? Some of you try to be sanctified. You know, you're, you're frustrated. It's like, I'm just perplexed, okay? Um, Paul says, I'm perplexed, but not in despair. Not in despair. I could be in despair, but I'm not in despair. I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I'm struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. What he's saying here is, I am cast down, but not destroyed. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I have fallen, I've stumbled in something, but I'm not laying on my face in the dirt. I'm not destroyed. In Psalm 73, 26, the writer says, My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my life and my portion forever. My flesh and my heart fail. Hudson Taylor took a hold of that verse when he was extremely discouraged. I believe this was around the the death of his wife when he took a hold of this verse. Flesh and heart may fail. And he wrote in in a letter, he said, let them fail and underlined it. Let them fail. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Failure is never final for a righteous man. Why is that? Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. He's not going to be discouraged. He's not going to just go splat spiritually. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. What is the reason? Because the Lord upholds him with his hand. This is fascinating. God upholds the decision of a good man. He upholds it. David cried out to be upheld by God's spirit in the midst of his sin. Psalm 51 He says, uphold me with thy free spirit. Matthew Henry comments on this. The root shall be kept alive, though the leaf wither, and there shall come a spring after winter. You may fail. Maybe you've already failed. Um, I was frustrated by the sickness that prevailed right after camp. And it seems like We're fighting a spiritual battle as well as a physical battle. Satan wants you to fail. Satan wants you to lay flat on your face. And it's not unique to teens. It's not unique to any of any person here. I myself yesterday, as early as as recent as yesterday, was discouraged extremely about a particular thing. And you know what? Whispers flooded my spirit. God doesn't listen to your prayers. God doesn't hear you. That was yesterday. Satan hates us. He wants us to fail. He wants us to he wants us to splat spiritually. And as I sat there, I remember where I was as I sat there yesterday, I had studied this passage and I could hardly it was so intense that discouragement. I thought, you know, I studied this passage recently. <laughs> And it's like the Lord told me something that I know that's not true. (laughs) This is wrong. And I, I eventually remembered that the steps of a good man 
are ordered by the Lord. He's establishing those steps. Though he fall, though he fail, he won't be utterly cast down. The Lord upholds him with his hand. Have you ever tried to, not tried, have you ever helped a child along through a busy place? One of my terrifying places is a parking lot. I have nightmares of my kids running in between cars and getting hit by cars. And uh, when, they're, when they're small, like Courtney's age, you know, we lead them by the hand. And sometimes, you know, when, as we're going, we need to hurry a little bit, so we're walking a little fast. And, and when you hold a child's hand, how do you do it? Do you hold out your finger and say, now hold Daddy's hand, because her hand only holds my finger right there. Do you hold, does, does she hold on to me? Or do I hold on to her? I literally give her two fingers and my thumb comes over top, okay? Gently, of course. But it's not going, she's not going anywhere, okay? And as we go through the, through the parking lot, she might trip over a puddle or something. And have you ever felt this before? You're leading a child by the hand and, you know, everything just goes loose, you know? And all of a sudden, it's like, what happened? But your hand is, your, God's given us this instinct with our children. Your hand grows tighter. And you could literally, if the child is small enough, you could literally just continue to pick them up and just hold them and you carry them the rest of the way because you're upholding them. And that's what God is doing with us. Sometimes, you know, we feel like we're holding on to God's hand. God's holding on to you, friends. And, and he feels it go limp. He, he sees that you're, you're struggling. Though he fall, though she fall, she will not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand, upholds her with his hand. God delights, teens, in the path that you're taking. I am proud of every single one of you and learn some things even hearing your testimonies today. God is excited about the path that each of you are taking. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but some of you have probably failed in your decision uh, over the past few weeks But God is still excited about the direction that you're taking. And He is going to uphold you with His hand. He's established the steps that you've you've taken. He's led you to that point. That was His plan. And He'll uphold you in your failure if you continue in this direction. Every single one of us in here, God is upholding you with His hand. And he's He's delighted with the direction that you're taking. Let me just challenge you if there should be someone in here today who you're not headed God's direction I don't know I have any idea who you are let me just challenge you there is nothing like walking with the Lord and heading heading his direction and having God delight in your in your life delight in the direction that you're taking give your life to the Lord you heard it I don't know five times over from the teens give God the entire throne of your life don't hold out on the Lord You will not be disappointed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for establishing our steps. Thank you that you empower our steps and that you delight in the direction that we're taking. I pray that as some may stumble this week, Lord, that they would truly discover that you are with them, that they will not be utterly cast down, for you uphold them with your hand. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, if there's someone here struggling, Lord, we have, we feel burdened for them. There's a sense in which they even know the direction that they're headed is not the the direction that you would have for them. Lord, would you give them repentance that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil? you would lead them to a full experience of your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to turn to 91. We sang this right before the message. We're going to turn to the, uh, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. 91, let's stand together as we sing. Though dark be the night and long be the day, Lord, make me follow in thy perfect way. Though come at sorrow, though great be my pain, 
Lord, make me serve thee, come sunshine or rain. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord, for the Lord, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Amen. The choir is going to practice briefly here right after the service. The children's choir will not be practicing this afternoon, so uh, children, you get the afternoon off. Um, but uh, we'll plan on a brief choir practice here in just a moment. Thank you. You're dismissed. <laughs>